Good afternoon, I'm Bruce Gewertz, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Surgeon in Chief here at Cedar sinai It is my pleasure to welcome a, a very distinguished physician and good friend, Phil Flushner. Phil, welcome. Glad to be here, Bruce. Phil, tell us a little bit about your background. Where were you born? I was born in Montreal, uh, Canada, and then I uh, came to the U.S. Uh, for medical school, and I've been in here since then. So where did you go to medical school? I went to medical school in Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York City. It was one of the few uh, uh, medical schools in those days that was accepting uh, Canadian students. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. And how did you get interested in colorectal surgery? Well, I didn't know so much about, I knew I wanted to do surgery. I did not know what type of surgery I wanted to do. And then uh, there was a mentor for me, which I think a lot of us in medicine uh, uh, begin to gravitate towards one field or another based on people we see and people, their behaviors around us. And there was a colorectal surgeon in Mount Sinai, New York, where I did my residency, who quite frankly, still to this day, is the best doctor I ever met. And he's a colorectal surgeon. And I said, I want to be like this guy. And it just led me to lead on the path of colorectal surgery. You know, I know your brother's a great guy and also a very prominent urologist in Canada. Were there other doctors and surgeons in your family? Not at all. I was the first one. And then my brother followed behind. You know, he always followed me around wherever I went. But uh, no, we actually came from, uh, from uh, fashion, fashion design, believe it or not. Completely different from medicine. And I think the thing that led me to become a physician is that uh, when I was about 16, 17 years old, I was hacking around like a typical teenager in, in high school, and my grandfather got sick. And uh, he ended up passing away, but I liked, not liked in a weird way, but I liked the fact that I, I enjoyed seeing the camaraderie and the science that his physicians were using. And I said, I want to be like some of these guys and gals. Yeah, it's certainly true that so many of us, particularly surgeons, uh, at, at some very pressurable point in our life saw physicians that, that were doing the Lord's work and having fun doing it. And it motivated us to go into the field. So... Uh, I assume that colorectal surgery, even in, in those days, required a fellowship, and where did you do that? Yep, fellowship. I, tra like I did my residency at Sinai, New York, and then I went to Leahy Clinic just outside of Boston. I did a year of fellowship there. Also, in between, I took a year off and I did some research during my residency, and I also took, did a six-month surgical endo fellowship uh, at the Mass General, which was really a lot of fun, and uh, that really taught me or at least reinforce sort of my, my, con my love of colorectal surgery because I did enormous amounts of endoscopy. In those days, the attending didn't necessarily have to be in the hospital all the time. So I was literally scoping day and night uh, by myself after I learned how to do it, obviously. So it was just a fantastic experience. Like many of us, uh, you started your career well before uh, laparoscopy was in invented, and we're certainly through your training. How did you learn laparoscopy? Well, you know, when I, when I graduated uh, a fellowship and also in my residency, I never did a, lap a laparoscopic case, any laparoscopic case. And what I did is when I learned, when I, uh, when I came into uh, practice, um, I saw the advantage of laparoscopy. I saw the advantage of it not only for some of the early experience we had, but also because of the studies that everyone else was having uh, and showing that it was an advantage to the patient. And slowly but surely it came about. And quite frankly, a lot of the, col the laparoscopy that I uh, learned was from our fellows. Our fellows came from divergent programs where they learned laparoscopy and they taught me. And, uh, and anyone always thinks that when you have a when you're a program director, for example, that you're the only one teaching and you never learn anything anymore. We learn enormous amounts from our fellow. The learning goes back and forth and always will continue to be. And that's what makes surgical education so much fun. Yeah, I can certainly agree with that. And, and it's incredible the diversity of experience that your colorectal fellows bring to the institution, like our residents and all the services. And uh, when you get a young person who's a, a, in their fellowship years, they've already completed their residency, often somewhere else, and we can actually cross-pollinate with our colleagues very reliably uh, through our fellows. Uh, tell us a little bit about colorectal cancer. I know that that, that uh, is, is a large portion of your practice, and it's also one of the cancers in which the screening study has been actually shown to improve uh, the outcome of patients. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, the way you think about it conceptually is that colon cancer arises from polyps. Polyps themselves are not cancer. They, um, they, the, the patients don't know about them, but we detect them at colonoscopy and we take them out. 
And the reason that's so important is that it's really the, one of the only cancers, except maybe for, for, uh, for cervical cancer in a woman, that's completely preventable. I mean, if you think of all the cancers there are there, prostate cancer, breast cancer, you have to have a cancer established already to pick it up on a screening exam, a mammogram, a blood test, whatever you're using. Colon cancer affords the ability to prevent it. And, and, and I'm sorry, colonoscopy prevents it. And that's the reason why colonoscopic screening is so vitally important. Anyone over the age of 45 is recommended to have a colonoscopy at least every five to 10 years. And it's finally now showing, that, uh, coming to fruition, that the incidence of colorectal cancer is going down. That's, that's fascinating. So what, uh, I'd like to continue in that reign, but I'd like to come back to the etiology of colon cancer in just a minute. But um, what, you, you mentioned every <coughs> five to 10 years, but there's certain criteria that would recommend that a patient have more frequent colonoscopies. Uh, could you go over the most of the indications for more frequent colonoscopies? Sure. The average risk patient is every five to 10 years. Patients that need it, for example, every three years are an example, with some are patients that have a first degree relative with colon cancer, a mother, a father, a brother, uh, God forbid, a daughter or a son. Uh, those are the patients that need to be uh, need to undergo surveillance, we call it. In other words, just colonoscopy every three years. They don't have to have symptoms. You don't want to wait for the symptoms to occur because by that point, it's too late. So those patients need a colonoscopy every three years to make sure that they're, if they have polyps, that we can prevent the development of cancer. Certainly, if they've already had polyps, that also puts them at a higher risk. Let's say they had a colonoscopy three to four years ago, even though they don't have a family history. Those patients need to be uh, sc uh, screened or surveyed more often. And certainly, if they've had surgery themselves for a colon cancer, they need to be checked much more frequently than the general population. I remember years back when I was in medical school, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, they used to tell us that something like 50% of colon cancers were within the reach of a finger through a rectal exam, 80% or so through a sigmoidoscopy. And is that really true? That is not true. And that's the reason why a lot of us have recommended to not, for, not to rely just on sigmoidoscopies as screening, even though some of the studies have suggested it might be effective. You need to, the, the, the majority now of cancers, although so probably 50 to 60 percent are seen within within range of the sigmoidoscope. That also means that 50 odd percent or so are not seen within the range of a sigmoidoscope. And if you gamble wrong, you potentially lose your life. So that's the reason why we recommend colonoscopic screening uh, as a, the best way to prevent colorectal cancer. Yeah, I think the point you make is very interesting, and uh, that although mammography has some certainly positive screening effects. Uh, very few things are nearly as effective as colonoscopy uh, for screening for cancers. And, and also determining, as you said, risk, because if people have multiple polyps, they're going to need to be screened more frequently. So we also use the, the, the mammographic example of, of a reason why you should have a full colonoscopy, and that is that a sigmoidoscopy, by looking essentially at you know, a third of the length of the colon, is the equivalent of having a mammogram on one breast. So it really makes no sense. Obviously, the other breasts, you have no idea what's going on. So if you're going to do the exam, look at the whole thing. Make sure everything's okay. In addition to our increased sensitivity at discovering relatively early cancers because of the use of colonoscopy, uh, what has happened to the, I mean, how would you, how would you uh, approximate the incidence of colorectal cancer, uh, and particularly in the United States over the last 50 years? Has it gone up? Has it stayed stable? It's gone down slowly, but what's even though the overall incidence has gone down, it's been disturbing that the incidence of colorectal cancer has been increasing in younger patients. And we're not exactly sure why that's the case. We don't know if it's uh, diet. People have hypothesized it's diet sodas as an example, but no one really understands. We're seeing more and more patients in their 40s getting colorectal cancer, and that's one of the reasons why the guidelines published by the American Cancer Society, which used to include colonoscopy, or at least start colonoscopy at the age of 50, now has actually been pushed back to 45. That's one of the main reasons. So even though the overall incidence has been coming down because of colonoscopic screening, the, there's a disturbing increase incidence in young patients, and we don't know exactly why. Yeah, I think uh, we all have that experience of our friends and our friend network of some young person that develops colon cancer in their 40s, and by the time it's discovered, it's already metastatic. Are, are cancers in young people uh, more aggressive by nature? They tend to be more aggressive. And that's a, you know, that in combination with late detection, 
because most patients, you know, some, if a 40-year-old comes to your office and they have rectal bleeding, most of the time you're going to think that's hemorrhoids or something benign, obviously. But now, a lot of times the diagnosis gets delayed. You're not suspecting that in a young patient. And it, not only do they, are, are they picked up later, but also they tend to be more aggressive. So it's a bad, it's a bad combination. And I know that uh, colorectal cancer is not necessarily hormonally responsive, like, for example, breast or prostate cancer. But are there uh, different markers in colon tumors that, that may make you treat them differently, particularly with chemotherapy or radiation after the surgery? There are. There are many markers that guide uh, adjuvant therapy. Uh, after both, quite frankly, it also uh, and, uh, guides what's going, what happens before surgery. For example, if there's uh, rectal cancer, there's different forms of chemotherapy that are given based on the, on the, on the profile of the markers of the tumor. Uh, when not to get radiation, when not to get chemo, when not to get both. Surgery. After surgery, usually in colon cancer, there's no role for radiation usually, but it's usually chemo. And many of the chemos are guided by markers that the tumor expressed. And um, has the robot changed the way you surgically treat uh, colon cancer? Robots are controversial. Uh, some of the studies of robots have shown some improvement, particularly in the uh, very obese male. But most of the studies have shown very little, if any, advantage of robots. There probably is a role for robots in patients who have mid to low rectal cancers uh, in very obese males. That's probably the only place where one would have a cogent argument to, to argue that the robot is good. The concerns about using the robot is that it costs more and it takes longer. So I guess you're balancing that with obviously the better oncologic and uh, oncologic value of the robot. When I was in medical school and early in my residency, one of the common operations for rectal cancer was abdominal perineal resection, in which the rectum was removed uh, transanally and there was a, col a permanent colostomy made. H have there been changes in your approach to what they call low rectal cancers? Enormous changes. And, uh, you know, as colorectal surgeons, we're kind of known as the sphincter preserving doctors. Uh, because and it becomes about not only because of better neoadjuvant preoperative therapy using chemo chemo uh, therapy and radiation therapy, but also because of our surgical techniques. Laparoscopy has come in, as I mentioned, robots have come in. There's also a number of platforms that are available now using a transanal surgery that require that sometimes actually are, have no incision whatsoever to try to facilitate anastomosis, particularly in the difficult patient with a rectal cancer, for example, if they're an obese male. Uh, so those, those uh, surgical techniques have significantly reduced the incidence of, of requiring abdominal perineal resection for low and mid-rectal cancers. So what you're describing is, is a, uh, a marked improvement in the early detection of these cancers, assuming patients follow the rules and get their colonoscopy, and creative operations that can spare them a permanent uh, colostomy. Uh, what do you see as the future of the treatment and or diagnosis of colorectal cancer? I think as we move forward, we're gonna, um, we're gonna try to make colonoscopies, number one, easier. Uh, we're gonna potentially be using uh, or Im imaging studies potentially to do this, CT colonography as it begins to get better, uh, to, to um, only use colonoscopies in patients who are considered high risk as an example and not have to uh, scope everyone. You know, even to this day, even though colonoscopy has been shown extremely effective in reducing colorectal uh, risk and colorectal incidence, still approximately 40 to 50% of Californians still do not get colonoscopy. So if we have a potentially easier way for them to do it, that will be an enormous improvement. That's number one. Number two is as the, as the colon and rectal cancer um, markers become better. That will guide chemotherapy, that will guide radiation therapy. One of the things, for example, that's exciting in our field is for particularly for mid to low rectal cancers is to give them chemo radiation, but for, to continue it for a longer period of time, it's called total neoadjuvant therapy, also known as TNT. And there's some evidence that that not only can make the surgery better, but also might avoid surgery completely just like we do in other cancers. Like for example, anal cancer, many of you know that anal cancer is now essentially a non-surgical disease because those patients have chemo radiation and it's extraordinarily effective in avoiding abdominal perineal resections, which used to be the standard of care. Well over 95% effective. What we're finding is that as we're, as we're marking the tumor better, 
we're getting better chemotherapy, we're deciding which of the patients need radiation, that many of these patients regress and many of the tumors disappear. So we might be able to completely avoid any uh, re proctacting of rectal surgery at all. That, that is incredible. You know, the, one of the holy grails for most cancers is some type of serum-based biomarker. Have there been any in rectal cancer or colon cancer in general? Uh, you know, there's, for example, in colon, there's CEA, for example, but they're still very rudimentary. Some of those um, markers are coming out now. Were, and it's not so much serum markers. Uh, it's biomarkers within the tumor, for example, itself. Some people are using these things called circulating tumor cells to try to identify uh, in a blood test whether or not, in fact, the patient has a, has a cancer and try to guide those patients particularly to get a colonoscopy. But they're still, still in the rudimentary phase. But there's no question that as we become better to type these tumors, that there's going to be an easier biomarker beside a colonoscopy. I know there, in, in, in other GI problems, there are capsules that people can swallow that take pictures of your inside, but of course they still require the bowel preparation, and then you're unable to do anything about the polyp if you see it, and I, I wonder even if it's as good at detecting polyps as a colonoscopy. It is not as good, and as you said, there's the logistical problem of uh, doing uh, these types of tests, and then you find out that, for example, if you do a CT colonography, example, on a Monday morning, you have to prep, you have to receive air. You have to have a, an enema with air in, in insufflation. So you already have a little bit of discomfort. And now, you're, let's say you, you have that and the radiologist comes out and says, you, by the way, you have a one and a half centimeter polyp in your ascending colon. Where's the gastroenterologist or the colorectal surgeon to take that polyp off? We're busy doing other things. So it becomes a little bit of a logistical nightmare in terms of what to do. Obviously, the patients don't want to prep all over again, but that's what happens frequently. Yeah, led by you and your colleagues, uh, colorectal surgery here at Cedars-Sinai is one of our, our most notable and, and well-recognized services with terrific uh, results. Are there going to be enough colorectal surgeons in the future to take care of the, of the uh, need in the population? Well, we don't know that either. It's clearly increasing. The, the need for us is increasing as well. Uh, there are training programs that are out there. We, have, we happen to have one of the training programs. There's only about 60 training programs across the country. Uh, I happen to be the program director of the Colorectal Surgical Fellowship. We have one fellow every year. Uh, so um, it, it, we are clearly in demand nowadays, and I expect the demand for us to continue to increase as we get better and better techniques, of, particularly in rectal cancer and IBD. And, and finally, is the prevalence of colon cancer either in the United States or in countries that, that eat the proverbial Western diet different from the prevalence of colon cancer in other parts of the world? Very much so. And uh, that is all related to our diet. We have a much higher incidence of colorectal cancer in this country than other, form, other areas of the world. What is doing that is unknown. Red meat, fat, uh, no one really understands that very well. Having said that, though, there are places in the world that themselves still have, are still have colorectal cancer endemic. For example, we, we uh, um, uh, send uh, myself and one of our fellows, we go to Singapore every year, and literally their, their list of, of the operative surgeries is essentially all rectal cancer and colon cancer. That's probably a genetic basis, but they don't have theory, although they have somewhat of a Western diet. That's been there for eons like that. So there's something unique about the genetics of those patients that do it as well. And I assume that there's work being done to understand that, you know, that marker such that people could be screened for it genetically. Yes, sir. Very much so. Terrific. Well, Phil, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. Anytime.